Okay, so uh, we're going to today host a webinar um, with Nego Tracking, which is uh, a project of the advocacy branch of Climates. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. And we're going to do it on what the UNFCCC is. Um, it is the first webinar to understand what climate negotiations at the United Nations uh, are about. Uh, we're doing that so that our um, Nego trackers can understand better and be more efficient with their job and also so that the mates can learn about it also and since uh, some of our mates every year go to Conference of the Parties, the UN Climate Talks, then they, they get to learn about that and that's super valuable. Um, so I'm going to share my screen um, to present, the, to um, display the presentation. If you have any questions, uh, say so in the chat. You can either um, just put an X to say that you want to take a uh, speech uh, or write your question directly in the chat and um, I'll make sure that it stays fluid. Uh, and I'll try to answer all your questions. Okay? So. Sorry. I'm clicking the wrong button. Okay. Can you all see um, the presentation? Yes, we can. Yes, cool. I'm just going to add my point. So, as I said, we're going to talk about what the UNFCCC is. Um, so, a few words on climates and negative tracking in particular. So, I said that already that negative tracking was an advocacy project of climates. Uh, it's an international project and it focuses on uh, United Nations climate talks. Um, this year, uh, the two project coaches, which is me and Sarah Bittner, who is also in this call, uh, we redesigned the project um, and we are currently six active members um, and we do three different things. We analyze negotiations and policies through articles and papers that we write and publish. Uh, currently, we're writing, we're working on two different topics, first on climate finance and second on human rights and gender. Uh, we educate mates uh, and general public uh, through trainings, webinars, toolkits, exactly like we're doing right now. And finally, we represent climates in negotiations at the United Nations, uh, especially through submissions that we send to the UN to give climates point of view on what is happening over there. Um, we are starting right now a project of submissions related to um, a program that is called the Marrakesh Partnership. Um, so that's what we're doing at the moment and you'll have the occasion to ask more questions or if you want to join we'll give you our contact details later on. Um, so this webinar what we're going to talk about is what the UNFCCC is. So UNFCCC I'll say it now it stands for United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Very ugly word. Um, so UNFCCC or UNFCCC is uh, easier to use. Um, this is the basis of what climate negotiations are about. So it's important to understand what UNFCCC is to get what we're doing, to know what to work on. I'll get through a brief history of climate change negotiations, um, explain the UNFCCC structures and how negotiations work in practice. Uh, then we'll talk about who is at United Nations Climate Talks, um, who's there and what do they do. And finally, uh, we'll have a Q&A uh, session. Um, okay, 
So what is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change? A few facts. Um, I'll say that the basis that you need to know before I start is that there is climate change in the world. But I think that you all know that and you all know what climate change is about. It's a disruption in natural climate system that is caused by human beings' uh, emissions due to their activities. We call that anthropogenic activities and that cause damages. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. Um, so yeah, uh, humans' activities are disrupting climate system and that has an impact on our societies and on nature and it, it threatens our lives basically. Uh, countries all over the world, they realized that in the 70s, they took conscious that it was a global problem and that they needed to address that at a global level. And a big step that they took was in 1992, they met at uh, what we call the Rio Earth Summit, um, which was a major conference that led to three uh, big um, environmental agreement. One on desertification, uh, one on biodiversity, and the third one on climate change. And this is the one that we're gonna talk about. The agreement on climate change was adopted in May, 1992, and then it was uh, presented for ratification during that summit in June, 1992. Um, and it is called the UNFCCC, that's the name of it. So the, United, the UNFCCC, which we also call the convention, is a text. Um, it has been ratified by uh, 197 countries that in the text are called parties, and that's an important word to remember. Uh, and they all agreed in the text that they would meet once a year, uh, starting from 1995, at conferences, conferences of the parties, COPs, which is the big climate events that happen every year in principle in November and December, uh, where all countries and civil society meet to talk about climate and our future. Um, any question with that to start with? Okay, so um, what is the convention about? It's a text, it's not that long. Uh, the first article is about definitions, uh, so not that interesting, but the article two is um, the ground, the basis of, of uh, the convention. It defines its objectives. I highlighted the important parts of it. Um, and what it says is that it recognizes that humans have an impact on the climate system and that there needs to be um, international coordination effort to stabilize the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere so that it's not harmful to neither humans nor society, uh, nor, sorry, uh, the environment, our ecosystems. And we need to make sure that we keep uh, those levels of uh, greenhouse gases low enough so that our environment and our societies can adapt to the changes that will occur because of climate change. That means two important things. The UNFCCC recognizes that there is a need for net zero emissions already. They say that we cannot, at some point in time, we will have to stop emit CO2. And second, they recognize that there will be unavoidable impacts because of climate change, no matter how, how fast and how efficient we stop our emissions. So those are two important things to remember. Um, sorry, my laptop is a bit slow. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, then article three of the convention is details the principles 
of what of the UNFCCC, the principles that the countries will have to respect. Um, those are the most important one. Um, the first one sets something that concerns climate a lot and that's why i put it first it's the concept of uh intergenerational uh justice and equity the fact that um everything that's done now will not only affect uh the present generation but the future generations as well and since uh, as youth we are the ones who will be impacted in the future it, was very, it is very important that this notion is one of the core principles of the convention. Um, the second one is also extremely important. It's the concept of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. What this says is that um, all countries, oh, people are trying to join the call, so I will have to, make sure that they're in sorry so all countries have a role to play in fighting climate change all countries to some extent contribute to climate change through the emissions that they have and all countries to some extent will be impacted by the if, um, by the effects of climate change but and that's the common part in common but differentiated responsibilities. Um, but the notion of differentiated responsibilities means that countries are not all equals because some countries ha are historical emitters and they have emitted a lot more uh, through time. Some countries are current big emitters, they emit a lot either at a national level or just per capita, per individual level. Uh, some countries uh, don't have the financial, technical um, skills, infrastructures, um, infrastructure knowledge to deal with this issue by themselves and they need the support of other countries. Some countries are not responsible for a lot of what is happening right now, but are facing major impacts of uh, climate change. And uh, I am thinking of uh, most vulnerable countries located in Sub-Saharan Africa and um, small island states, for example, the Caribbean or the Pacific Islands. So that notion uh, of common but re differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities means we're all in this, but we don't have the same background, we don't have the same responsibility, and we don't have the same mean to act. And we need to cooperate to make sure that everybody gets out in a fair way. Um, a third point very important in this is, sorry, my laptop is fucked up again. Uh, the precautionary measures that I also think is very important uh, because countries recognize that it is their duty to act early and to act efficiently to avoid as much of what is happening. It means that if something is unsure, we'll play it on the safe side, um, which in my opinion is not what's happening right now. Um, it also hides notions of um, adaptation and uh, facing the impacts that will be caused, the, facing the losses and the damages that will be caused by impacts of climate change if we do not take those precautionary measures. The last two points uh, deal with a sustainable development uh, that is promoted by the UNFCCC uh, and uh, the fact that cooperation between countries should maintain sustainable economic growth um, and i mentioned those two points because there is some disagreement within the climate communities community some researchers some uh, academics some members of civil society consider that it is not possible uh, to have a net zero carbon world uh, if we continue to have economic growth, for example. Um, and they say that already 
the UNFCCC from the start, the convention uh, was not designed to achieve uh, a zero carbon world. So that's a piece of reflection. If you guys want to talk about this later, that's um, something that is possible. I'm adding new arri late arrivals, sorry. Okay, next slide. Um, next, I want to talk about the areas of works of work that are mentioned in the convention. So the article four details what the countries have to work on, what they have to do. Basically, what they have to do is to cooperate on the points that are detailed in this slide. So they have to make sure that all the countries display how much how many how much greenhouse gas they emit um, on a regular basis so that we can track where we are in terms of achieving net zero emissions um, they have to cooperate on topics related to uh, mitigation which is stopping the sources of greenhouse gases and enhancing the, the sinks of the greenhouse gases they have to cooperate on adaptation measures to the impacts of climate change. They have to cooperate on uh, developing technologies, uh, their application and diffuse them and transfer that knowledge uh, to regions that do not have access to them. Um, they have to cooperate on sustainably managing the carbon six and reservoirs of carbon uh, uh, and res carbon reservoirs such as forests and oceans. And that's why those are two two topics, forest, oceans, ecosystems, that come very often in negotiations, in the talks that we hear about. They have to cooperate on loss and damage, um, loss and damage that can be caused by the impacts of climate change. Uh, they have to cooperate on research on climate change, observation of the impacts of climate change. They have to cooperate on education, training, and public awareness, which is a topic that climates has a very strong focus on. I will come back to that later. Um, and finally, but most importantly, um, there is this principle that global North countries, which is air quoted developed countries, have to provide financial, technical, and institutional support to global South countries, which is linked to this common but differentiated uh, responsibilities principle that I mentioned before. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, so now that you have a good idea of what the convention is about, um, we're going to talk more specifically about negotiations um, about the climate talks, the COPs, about what has been happening uh, during those times, what they are about, and how they work, what they look like, more or less. So negotiations started 20 years ago. Um, during that time, we have uh, reached ag two agreements, and let's be honest, a lot of disappointment. So I told you about already the Rio Earth Summit, which was when the UNFCCC was created. Um, they decided that they would meet once a year during COPS. Uh, and when they started working on gathering during the first COP in 1995, it was in Germany, they decided to come up with an agreement a strategy on how they would curb emissions. Um, that agreement, they, re they reached it in 1997 during COP3, which was in Kyoto, uh, through an agreement that was called the Kyoto Protocol. It was the first climate agreement. It was uh, meant to enter into force in 1997 and to cover the period from 1997 to 2012. 
Um, and parties had agreed that uh, before 2012, they would come up with a new agreement that would uh, cover the period from 2012 to beyond. Uh, and that's what they meant to do in 2009 when they met in Copenhagen to set the basis for the next agreement. Sadly, during co the Copenhagen COP, there was a lot of disagreement. Um, a lot of countries were not satisfied with the way the Kyoto Protocol had been working. Uh, there was a feeling of unfairness. Uh, and because of that, countries did not manage to reach, agree to reach consensus on what the next agreement should be. So Copenhagen, which was supposed to be a very important COP, um, did not meet expectations and did not come with a new agreement. Um, so as an emergency measures, countries decided to uh, leave the possibility to extend the Kyoto Protocol to cover the periods from 2012 until when they would reach a next agreement through an amendment that is called the Doha Amendment, but I'm not going to expand on that further. Um, and in the meantime, they started working on something completely new. They started from scratch uh, and built uh, an agreement that is very different in the way it works from uh, the Kyoto Protocol. They reached the final agreement in 2015 um, in something that's called the Paris Agreement. Uh, you probably all heard about it. Um, it is the major second climate agreement of the UN and it covers a period from 2015 until an undetailed date. It's it's ongoing process, but there are some stepping stones, especially in 2100. Um, next slide, I will explain a bit more what the Paris Agreement is about so that you guys get an understanding of what negotiations have been uh, have been about since 2015, um, but I won't explain what the Kyoto Protocol is and what all the disagreements that I just mentioned are, because hopefully we will host another webinar on that specific topic, um, because it takes a lot of time and it is extremely interesting. Um, so a few words on the Paris Agreement. Um, as I said, it was adopted in Paris in 2015. It has a very precise objective, which is to keep the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels with efforts to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. So we try to maintain um, warming below two degrees and that's what we call the two degrees target and the 1.5 degrees target. Uh, and they do that through the publication of what we call nationally determined contributions, um, NDCs. These are um, commitments of countries on what they will do to stop climate change in their countries. Countries individually are asked um, every five years to publish new NDCs that are supposed to be more ambitious than the one that they published five years before. And their NDCs have to set targets and uh, actions that they are committed to achieve um, to mitigate climate change on their territory. Um, so the period from 2019, uh, 2015 to 2019 is called the pre-2020 era where, uh, and it was meant for ambition enhancement. It was uh, a total of four years where countries had to work together to increase ambition so that their NDCs would be as ambitious as possible. Um, and as a proof of commitment, they published indication um, uh, intention NDCs, which are a first draft for their future NDCs to show what at the moment they would be willing to do. 
was a way for the world to see where ambitious ambition is before 2020 and how much we still need to push it to to reach a zero um, emissions level um, car world as soon as possible uh, during that period as well 2015 2019 or more precisely 2016, 2018, um, parties also negotiated what is called the Paris Rule Book. Uh, what is the Paris Rule Book? Um, well, basically, the Paris Agreement is a very simple text that just sets the basic principles, objectives, and objectives uh, of countries, but it doesn't detail the rules of the game. It doesn't give very specific, specific indications on what they can do, what they cannot do, and how they should do it. And that's what the Paris rule book is supposed to uh, specify. And so countries had three years to negotiate all the sections of the Paris rule book. So to detail all the, thing, all the rules that will set the climate game um, starting from 2020. Um, they managed to finish almost everything except one article that is related to um, carbon markets uh, that is still going on because they do not reach agreement on that one specific point. I won't go any further. Uh, it's quite specific, um, but it is a topic that raises a lot of disagreements. Um, and in 2019, so COP25 25 was held, it was last December, um, it was supposed to be held in Chile. It was cancelled because there was a uh, pop popular uprising in Chile, a lot of protests against the government, and it was not safe and secure to organize there, so they moved it to Spain in Madrid. Um, it was organized in a state of emergency. They were, had very little time to organize it. But most of all, COP25, which was supposed to be the COP of ambition, uh, was obviously characterized by a lack of ambition. Countries did not show any commitment to go beyond business as usual. It created a lot of frustration within civil society um and civil society that was at the cop uh started unauthorized so illegal protests within the cop um to claim for climate justice which was a big motto within especially within the civil society especially the youth movements who were asking for climate justice and intergenerational justice uh so that's what cop 25 was about and this year is 2020. So as I said, starting from 2020, countries were supposed to start publishing their NDCs. Um, and every five years, they are supposed to renew them. So 2020 is the beginning of the application of the Paris Agreement. It's a very important year. Um, but as we will see, it's not happening as expected. Um, that will be the last slide of the of the presentation when we will open discussions on what is currently happening uh, within climate negotiations uh, i'm doing a quick break to check if everybody's all right so far um, any um, question any message if i don't get any sign then i guess everything is fine Yep. Okay. Then we can continue. Um, so this section is about general structure of the UNFCCC. Um, we've explained how it works. Now we're going to see how it is structured. Um, so at the basis and at the top, actually, of the convention, you have the parties, the countries that signed it. They are the ones that decide everything, that make all the decisions. 
um, and that run all the structure of the convention. They, their role is to sign and to apply agreements. As we said, there are, there are three agreements that were signed. There is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, the Kyoto Protocol, and the Paris Agreement. For each of these agreements, countries have created structures that are called supreme bodies that are meant to guarantee the implementation of um, these agreements. So when we talk about conference of the parties, for example, COP, the conference word stands for the event, the place where they meet, the, the yes, the event, the meeting, but it also stands for the um, gathering of the countries and the body that is in charge of making sure that the UNFCCC, the convention is applied and how and to track how well it is applied. So the COP deals with the convention. There is a supreme body for the Kyoto Protocol, which is called CMP, and a body for the Paris Agreement that is called CMA. Now, when we talk about, uh, let's say, uh, COP25, 25 means that it's the 25th meeting of the Conference of the Parties. But it's not the only event that happens at that moment because the countries also use that moment to gather as the Supreme Body CMP that deals with the Kyoto Protocol. So it was, COP25 was also the 15th meeting of CMP and it was also the second meeting of CMA. So COP25 was actually COP25, CMP15 and CMA2. But the COP serves as the names of CMP and CMA indicate, serves as a meeting, as a reason for other Supreme Bodies to meet. I hope that makes sense. Um, and Supreme Bodies decided that they would create another level, a subsidiary level of structures that would help them with the implementation of those agreements. They are called subsidiary bodies. I see a message. Okay. Um, there are called subsidiary bodies. There are two. The first one is a subsidiary body for scientific and technological advice, SEBSTA. It is in charge of uh, supporting the sub supreme bodies with everything related to technology, science, um, knowledge in general. The second one is called subsidiary body for implementation. It is in charge of supporting supreme bodies for anything that is related to the implementation per se of the agreements, uh, supports everything that has a link to support uh, to countries um, on how to implement those agreements within their specific national um, framework. Uh, and these two subsidiary bodies, uh, they are helping with all agreements with no difference. They are helping with everything. I would add as a last point that um, the Supreme Bodies and the subsidiary bodies are run by parties as well. Their structures, there is a board for each of them. Uh, the board members are elected within uh, parties negotiations, the negotiation teams, so representatives of those parties. Um, so it's all party matter. Um, civil society cannot uh, have a role to play in subsidiary bodies or supreme bodies. Um, if you want to know who are negotiators, um, in general, they are members of minister of ministries who have a specific knowledge on the topic that they will negotiate about. Uh, teams can be very big or very small, um, can be 10 people and can be 50 people. It depends on how well, like 
it depends on the capacities of the country. Um, so now that we saw the different the different uh, levels of structure that exist within the UNFCCC, I want to explain how they interact. And that's about explaining how a negotiation work. So as I said, parties are at the top. They are the ones who decide everything eventually. Uh, cops, even if they are open to civil society, are really a country, a party thing. Um, and they could as well be, be organized without civil society to parties it wouldn't change much. Um, the UNFCCC processes, we say that they are country driven. So that's what I was saying, that everything is decided and, in, and initiated by countries and they are consensus based. Uh, consensus based means that for a decision to be taken, all countries need to agree. Um, this means that uh, if one country is not okay with what is being discussed, then no, no agreement, no decision is taken. Um, it has its advantages. It means that a decision that is taken has very strong support, is very legitimate, but it also means that reaching a decision uh, can take a very long time and that the outcomes are often quite weak. Um, so the parties, they, um, they seat uh, at Supreme Body uh, meetings. Supreme Bodies will decide what needs to be created in order to uh, reach the implementation of the agreements that they signed. So uh, let me take an example. In the Paris Agreement, for example, it is specified that uh, indigenous people, uh, indigenous people's right needs to be protected and uh, that their knowledge needs to be protected and promoted as valuable knowledge to fight against climate change. Um, countries realized that there was no um, adapted tool existing uh, within the Paris Agreement to um, support uh, this specific um, point of the Paris Agreement, indigenous people matter. So they decided that they would create a tool that would be dedica dedicated to indigenous people's knowledge and prote right protection. Um, so Supreme Body says, we're going to create a tool, we're going to go, call it uh, a platform for local communities and indigenous people. Um, and for it to run, we need to have terms of references. Uh, we need to know what its objectives will be. We need to know what its structure will be, uh, how many people will, will be part of that uh, tool, will run that tool, who these people will be, for how long will that tool be used? What are its objectives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these terms of references, they need to be discussed and they need to be agreed by all, the, all parties. So that will be the topic of negotiations during the conferences. So the Supreme Body CMA will say, next COP, we are going to um, negotiate to determine the terms of references for a platform for local people and, and indigenous people. And we will ask um, one of the subsidiary bodies to support us with that. We were going to ask uh, Substa to do that. It is effectively in reality Substa that is in charge of this topic. So the Supreme Body mandates Substa to lead talks related to the platform for local people, local communities and indigenous people. Uh, next step is that Substa organizes negotiation sessions in closed rooms um, with uh, negotiators um, from the different parties and they will talk, they will debate, they will discuss to come up with terms of references. This can take a long time. It can take 
uh, one cup, it can take two cups, it can take three cups, it can take forever. Uh, the idea is that once they reach an agreement, uh, the subsidiary body makes the parties vote. If all the parties agree, then that document, the final draft of the terms of reference, will go back up to the supreme body that will make the parties vote again as a text presented by the supreme bodies. And if all parties agree, it becomes an official document and it is integrated as a new tool of the Paris Agreement. Um, on the side, there is a box saying Secretariat. The UNFCCC has a permanent secretariat that is in charge of supporting the logistics of those processes. Uh, the secretariat is located in Bonn, Germany. If some of you have been to some climate negotiations, then they might have been to, um, to the UN campus in Bonn. Uh, okay, that was the toughest part. We're almost done. We have a final section on actors of UN climate talks. Any questions? No? Okay. So, as I said, negotiations are country driven. Um, but it doesn't mean that other people, that, that there are there are only country negotiators at those sessions and that us, um, NGOs, civil society, doesn't have a role to play in that. Um, so first I wanna finish on parties. They negotiate, of course, uh, but they, they're not just by themselves. It would be absolutely impossible if all the 197 countries were always sitting at a round table to try to come up with an agreement. That's way too many countries, way too many people. It's not possible. So how they do it in practice, they set up coalitions that are officially recognized um, by the convention and that are defined uh, either by uh, interest, economic interest, either by um, location or because they have common resources. Uh, I'll come up, I'll present a few. So you have the big, you have two different sections. You have the big square on the left and you have a smaller square on the right. Um, the left side is the global south countries and the right side is the um, Global North countries, also called Annex One countries, and Global South is sometimes called Annex Two countries. The biggest coalition is called G77 and China, and it gathers almost all Global South countries. Um, so, as I said, uh, coalitions can be because of uh, geography. So, for example, uh, the African group, the Arab group. Um, ILAC, which is about Latin America, South America to be more precise. Um, there's ALBA, which is uh, the Caribbean islands. Uh, then it can be about um, levels of development. So you have LDCs, which are the least developed countries, LMDCs, the least and medium developed countries. Um, it can be because of struggles. The SIDS, for example, small island developing states are struggling a lot. Uh, they are one of the most impacted groups um, by climate change. Um, some countries can be in terms of economic interest or shared resources. You have the OPEC group, which is well known because it's the fossil fuel um, exporters country, countries. Um, and so in Annex two, you have two big groups. Uh, the first one is the European Union, which has one specific, uh, which is very specific, the European Union, because it is a coalition, but it also counts only as one vote when it comes to decisions. European countries, your countries of the European Union, um, cooperate and uh, they coordinate on their strategy. They have a common strategy. And when they sign something, they all sign it as one voice. 
uh, last group is the umbrella group, which is uh, the group that showed um, dissatisfaction uh, on the Kyoto Protocol. And it's often countries that are not very cooperative in terms of climate action, uh, just to mention the US and Russia. Countries that are often problematic in negotiations and that tend to block the talks. Um, so that's about countries. So as I said, countries are not the ones at those negotiations and climate sends uh, people uh, at every talk. And that is because civil society is allowed during those processes. In civil society is divided into constituencies, which is interest groups, interest group of uh, NGOs um, that gather and cooperate and these constituencies have a voice at some specific points of negotiations. There are nine constituencies. The business and industry uh, constituency, bingo, which is the NGO uh, you can recognize, environmental NGOs, NGO, local government and municipal authorities, women and gender, indigenous people, research and independent, farmers, trade unions, and youth NGOs. Climates is part of several um, constituencies, uh, but it, it's mostly part of Yongo, uh, and it plays some role in NGO and in uh, women and gender constituency. Um, as civil society in climate negotiations, we are allowed to talk um, in very specific moments. We're given uh, a speech right at the beginning of the session during the plenary. Every constituency has a two minute speech. At the closing plenary of every COP, same two minutes. Um, sometimes at the opening of negotiations, NGOs, well, constituencies will be given the right to make an official speech. What I'm saying is, uh, what I'm talking about with these speeches, they are official and they are recorded by the UNFCCC. Um, but besides that, our role as NGOs is to influence negotiators uh, on our own interests, on what we think should be in uh, the texts that are negotiated during the sessions. So it's a lot of lobbying, it's a lot of um, interaction with different actors, a lot of networking. It's about making actions outside of the negotiate negotiations and rooms, uh, protests. Um, I'm trying to find other things that we do. We can write open letters. Um, so all of that is lobbying action and that's what advocacy at the UN is about. And there's a lot of coordination within uh, different constituencies to try to make that effective and be as strong as possible. Um, final group, very important group that is present at the COPS and that is present in UNFCCC in general, it's the IPCC. A few words about that. It stands for Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It was created in 1988 by the WMO and by UNEP. And its objective is to provide governments, so parties, with all levels of scientific information that they can use to develop climate policies. So they are there to provide the background science that will support all the measures, all the agreements that are negotiated. Um, they are independent, uh, they do systematic work, they are volunteer researchers, they come from all the 195 countries members of the IPCC, and their main piece of work is assessment reports that are published uh, periodically, and that summarize everything that is known about the drivers of climate change, about the impacts and future risks of climate change, and how adaptation and mitigation can reduce those risks. 
Um, so that's what the IPCC is about. Um, and lastly, when my laptop wants to change the slide. Hmm. Uh, lastly, I wanted to tell you a few words about what is happening this year. So this year was supposed to uh, host uh, COP26. It should have been in Scotland, uh, in Glasgow. Um, sadly, as you all know, there is currently a global pandemic that has locked the entire planet uh, with impacts on our ability to host meetings and conferences. Um, and therefore, most climate talks have been cancelled for this year. It includes COP. There was one major uh, climate talk, climate event that was, that has been uh, held last week. It's called the Petersburg Dialogue. And it's a meeting of uh, ministers uh, from that are have signed the COP, they meet to uh, enhance ambition on topics related to uh, the Paris Agreement. They do that every year, and they did that online. Um, so COP has been cancelled for this year, and it should be reported to 2021. Uh, we still do not know the exact date, but most likely it will be after May 2021 which means that everything is going to be shifted over a year, that COP27 uh, will be held in 2022. Um, it sets a question on, a lot of people have asked, why is it not possible to uh, organize a COP virtually? Um, and the truth is that it is very hard to create the human link um, that allows negotiations to be effective. It is very hard to get to um, guarantee the security of these meetings and to allow for fair participation of civil society. Uh, with climates, we are currently uh, experimenting a lot on virtual action, virtual um, advocacy movements and it is wonderful to get to experience those new tools, but we also see the limits of it. Um, but it doesn't mean that nothing should be done. And that's where I will end uh, my presentation and that I would like to open dialogue, questions that you have on the presentation, um, anything that you wanna talk about. Um, so that's it. Uh, if last slide wants to show. No, it doesn't. Mm. So, yeah, final slide. Uh, there's Sarah's contact uh, email if you guys want to email us. And I will stop the, the presentation here and stop sharing my screen. Mm. Okay, anyone has a question or a comment, something that they would like to talk about? Well, first, you can say thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I just have a question concerning the, the MVP. Do you think they're going to be published in 2020, knowing that there is a COVID 19 going on? Or do you think it would be postponed also? No. Um, so publication of NDCs has not been postponed. Um, there was actually uh, a an informal deadline that had been set for February 2020 for countries to publish their NDCs. And almost no countries uh, respected that deadline and now from once in a, like once in a while we observe um, 
uh, we, we see that countries publish their NDCs. So um, I don't have the, total, the entire list in mind, but some that published it already, Sarah helped me, are uh, Chile, um, New Zealand, I think. Uh, which ones? Talk. Japan published in February, I think. Yeah. Um, and South Korea, even though I'm not sure they published their NDC, but they published like a Green Deal, like similar to the EU's um, due to the election uh, that happened like two weeks ago. Uh -huh. And what we observe is that in general, most of their NDCs are not very ambitious. Um, the deal was that they were supposed to stay at least as ambitious as what they promised before 2020. Uh, and to go beyond that, um, but they don't show a lot of commitment in making that a lot more ambitious. And one of the fears that we have is that with the whole pandemic situation, it pushes them back from uh, taking ambitious steps. Yeah, thank you. I'm afraid that it's going to happen. But uh, let's see. But I, I don't. I don't. I didn't remember. Uh, any country that published the NDC, so thank you for the reminder. Yeah, we are hoping to um, share on NDC publication with climates through social media um, so that people know about this, like who's, who has been submitting their NDCs, because this is, this is the root of the Paris Agreement and of what is going to lead climate action in the coming years. Cool. Any other question? I do want to say that I'm not involved in it, but um, for French mates, there is in the Facebook group uh, of the French mates, there is a link to a webinar that is organized by Climates in cooperation with Refed and Jacques on what it is to be at a COP and people who were at COP25 will give their experience. So if you guys are interested in that, feel free to join. Yes, it's next uh, Saturday. Yeah, cool. Oh, you're welcome, Estelle. Any other question? No question. Yep, Rayana. The subsidiary bodies. Um, they're not tools, they are structures. It's, it's hard to find the right wo word to say what they are. They are bodies, basically. They are uh, a group of people that are there to support um, the implementation of the agreements. Uh, so they have a board and in, in, print, no, in practice, they are the ones that are leading the negotiations. They are the ones who sit at the center of the table and uh, give indications on how they want the discussions to go. Um, they are facilitators. That's the word I was looking for, facilitators. Cool. I'm happy that I answered your question. Um, if you have feedback on the presentation, I'm happy to hear. You're welcome. Super. Great. Okay. If no one else has questions or comments on this, then we will end the presentation, the, the webinar. Um, then I want to thank you all for joining. Um, we hope to 
uh, host more of these um, soon in the future. And we hope to open that to more people than climates, include members from Yongo who would be interested. And even if possible, like create partnerships, that would be nice. Um, if you have feedback, if you thought it was interesting, if you want to learn more about what we do, let us know, send us a message. And we will uh, share the recording of this session so that everybody has access to it. Um, thanks again, everybody. I wish you all a very good evening for those who are in the same time zone of, as me, more or less, and a great day or night to the others. And I hope to see you all very soon. Bye. Well, thank you now.